Okay, okay. Uh, so first, oh, this is really, is that loud enough? Too loud? It's very difficult for me to engage it. Okay, uh, first I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is also kind of isoprometric inequality, um, and, uh, but more in the realm of Riemann manifolds and metric spaces. Um, so the problem actually is mostly considered in, in a, a field, two fields relatively far away from, 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 from geometric measure theory, uh, namely geometry and um, geometric group theory. But I'd like to show you how one can use um, techniques from geometric measure theory, mostly in metric spaces, to attack these problems. Um, and so this, at the same time, it's basically showing how geometric measure theory can be used. On the other hand, it should also be a bit of an invitation to consider problems, you know, these problems in geometry. As you will see, there's many, many open problems uh, that uh, we don't know how to solve. And I, I, I think uh, geometric measure theory gives a very powerful tool, tools. And of course, in, in geometry and geometric group theory, people don't really, are not so aware or not familiar with these techniques. Um, yes, so what's the problem? Um, so it's a sample problem. Um, I'll basically stick to the, to the um, easiest case. Um, and the first two hours, I will give basically an introduction to the problems and an overview. And then in the second uh, lecture on Wednesday, I will um, provide the tools. We set up the tools in geometric measure theory. And then we're going to attack these problems uh, using geometric measure theory. Um, so what's the problem? Um, the easiest problem of this kind is the following. You take a curve, a closed curve, say in R2, in R3, or wherever, and you try to solve Plato's problem. Plato's problem means you're trying to find a minimal surface you know, with this curve as a boundary. Okay? So now you do this for every curve. And what I'm interested in is, for a curve of given length, what is basically the curve that is hardest to fill. Okay? If you take a long, thin curve, of course, you can fill it with very little area. Okay? So you have to make it round. Okay? So for a round curve, as we saw you know, for the case of n equals to 2 of Alessio, you know, there we have the, just the classical isometric inequality, which tells you that basically the area you need to fill it in is just 1 over 4 pi times the length squared. Okay? The same thing, of course, works uh, in, in Rn. So there you have an upper bound by this, this, this amount, and you, know, you have equality if you have basically a flat uh, circle. Okay? So now, this is not really what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is now, so consider all curves of length of a given length r. Okay? So now look at the curve that is hardest to fill. Okay? And you take this, this area that you need to fill it. That gives you, you know, for every r, that gives you gives you a, a number, okay? And this is so-called, the called the filling area function, okay, in R of the space that you're in. For example, R2, R3, Rn, right? Or a Riemannian manifold, or maybe even a metric space. And the question is, you know, what can you say about the behavior of this function, okay? Of this isoprometric function or filling area function, okay? So now, first, we will uh, set this up. I'll, I'll, I'll say... I'll give a definition of, of area in metric spaces like in a talk, and then we define these filling area functions. Um, and then we will talk a bit about the growth spectrum. So what kind of growth behaviors? So we're always, here I'm always um, interested in when R goes to infinity. So large scale growth. Uh, we'll talk about a bit about what can we, um, what can we get for functions, okay, and then uh, we will look at a special class. We will see that, you know, in general, it's very difficult to, of course, for, for, for a given space to, to uh, estimate. So one class that has been uh, considered both in, 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 in geometry group theory and, on the other hand, in, uh, in geometric measure theory are nilpotent Lie groups. And then at the end of today, I'll give a, a bit of a motivation to, uh, to tell you, you know, why in geometry and uh, geometric group theory uh, do people study that? That's just a very small thing. So that's the part, the part one. Okay. Okay. So let X be a metric space. Okay. 
If you don't feel comfortable with this generality, just always think of Riemann manifolds already there. You know, all the problems are interesting and you know, many problems are, are still open. So you can uh, assume that. We're gonna, oops, that was one too far. Okay, so as I said, we now first, you know, let's define area. Okay, so we take a Lipschitz uh, map from the unit disk in R2 into your metric space. Forget for the moment this, this thing, this, the cam. And so we define its area simply as this integral. Okay, so the integral of the number of points, you know, on the surface that are, you know, the pre-image points, number of pre-image points, and we integrate with respect to the Hausdorff two measure. So if you have a, if you have a surface, a Lipschitz surface that basically hits, you know, folds up, then you count this with multiplicity. Okay. Um, so clearly, when phi is injective, then this is just the Hausdorff measure of the image. Okay. If you're in a Riemann manifold, you know that Lipschitz. Um, maps are differentiable almost everywhere by Rademacher theorem, okay, you know that this area is actually, or this, this integral is, uh, by the area formula, is uh, just the integral of um, the Jacobian. Okay, and the similar, so let's make this remark. And if we have a Riemann manifold, then the area as defined before is just the integral of the Jacobian of the, the derivative, okay? And the similar formula actually you can make sense of in arbitrary, when phi goes to an arbitrary metric space. Um, there you don't have differentiability, but you have so-called metric differentiability. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, okay, so now let's take a curve in our metric space. And as I said, we want to try to fill it with a minimal surface. For the moment, we'll just stick with so-called Lipschitz disks, so just uh, surfaces that are um, Lipschitz maps from the unit disk uh, of R2 to, to X, okay? And we want, of course, that at the boundary, um, this map coincides with, with C, okay? We call this the filling area. Later on, so the zero here, filling area zero, just says that we you know, go from the unit disk. Later on, we will actually look um, at um, at a, a more complex a topological type, we will actually consider um, integral currents, so uh, integral two cycles. Um, that, uh, yeah. But for the moment, I'd like to stick uh, with this. And now, the isoprometric function, or the filling area function, in X is defined as, so now we've taken minimal surfaces, basically, and now we're trying to look for the worst curves, curve to fill uh, of length r. So here L of C is um, just the length of C. Okay. So, as I said before, it's a two-step pro uh, uh, process. It's basically a, a min-max, right? Or a max-min uh, process. You first take the least area and you try to take the worst curve uh, possible. So that gives you a, a, a function. And clearly, you know, in R2, the classic class parametric inequality tells you that, you know, every curve, um, closed simple curve, bounds an area of at most 1 over 4 pi times uh, the length squared with equality if and only if it's the circle. We saw that today, like the, the most special case um, would be of what we saw today. Okay, so in R2 and actually Rn, um, for n bigger or equal to 2, we get that this is exactly 1 over 4 pi times r squared. Okay. So what about if we have a Riemannian manifold of sectional curvature bounded by some number kappa? Okay. Um, so when we have non-positive sectional curvature, then we can fill it a bit better, or we can fill it, you know, at least as, as good as in Euclidean space, okay? So the, 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 main, the main observation, or, you know, what, what you'll need there is that, um, so when you have sectional curvature 
you know, uh, non-positive sectional curvature, then basically the main observation is that if you look at the geodesic, at the triangle in your um, Riemannian manifold X, and if you compare it with a triangle in R2 that base has the same, you know, the same lengths of sides, then this looks thinner than this one. Okay? You can take this as a, as a definition of non-positive sectional curvature. And now, just intuitively, you can actually make this uh, precise. So intuitively, well, if this in your space is thinner than this, well then, you know, the area here looks to be smaller than the area here. So in some sense, you can expect that actually you should have something a little bit better. Okay. And actually, you can make this uh, into a proof okay, by, by um, uh, yeah, okay, we will see. So today, I give only very few proofs, and then uh, uh, we will go back to some of these results, and then, you know, actually, um, I'll give uh, more rigorous proofs. Okay. So if we have strictly negative sectional curvature, okay, if you have strictly negative sectional curvature, then... Um, it is bounded not by something quadratic, okay, but by something linear, okay, the filling area function. Um, so, of course, you know, for small r, it is still going to be of that order because with, this, with r small, you know, then this is clearly better, right? But for large r, this is much better than this, okay? On the one hand, we have quadratic or at most quadratic growth here, and here we have actually linear growth at most, right? So that is, you already see that this filling area function, that um, this detects something, okay? So here you can detect negative curvature, okay? So just note that the, 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 the important thing is that we have quadratic versus linear growth. Okay, the questions that one can ask, that have been asked a lot, are, well, what are the possible growth types of this function as r goes to infinity? Okay. In general, of course, this is a very difficult question. Well, one can first maybe ask it for general, but, you know, for any x you can try to determine, but that's extremely difficult. Okay. So, well, we have two conditions that make uh, life a lot easier. One is a curvature condition. Okay, you already see here, you know, indication why non-positive curvature should help. Okay, and another that is more similar to Euclidean space in some sense. To Euclidean geometry are nilpotent Lie groups. Okay, so in a certain sense, they're in group theory. You know, they're they're close to to to, to Euclidean groups, right? Okay, as you will see from geometry from a geometric point of view, this is actually gonna uh, is actually uh, quite different. Okay. So, for example, we can uh, look at this class. Another question that we might uh, ask is, what does the growth of the filling function for a certain space x, what does it tell us about the space? Okay. So the aim of the lectures here Oh, let me first maybe say, what do I mean by growth of functions? Okay. Um, we will distinguish the following growth um, types. Okay. So for any functions f and g, which are non-decreasing, you know, f, the filling area function is clearly non-decreasing, right? Um, we say that f or g grows at, at least as fast as f, if it is basically bigger or equal to f plus a linear term and plus a constant, okay, maybe plus a shift in the parameter as well. Okay. And we say that f and g have the same growth if f grows at least as fast as g and vice versa. Okay. So this 
first of all, having the same growth type is an equivalence relation. Okay. Um, secondly, it can detect polynomial growth. Okay. So, um, if so, r to the alpha grows like r to the beta, if and only if alpha equals to beta. Of course, whenever alpha and beta are bigger or equal to one, you know, smaller than one, because we add a linear term, it's gonna gonna be the same. Okay, we will always be, you know, looking at growth at least uh, linear. Okay, on the other hand. Um, it will not distinguish between various exponential growths. Okay, so e to the two r in our definition, uh, because we have this shift right in the parameter, uh, gives shows that it's exactly the same growth as e to the three r. So it's not uh, so sensitive to to, to 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 things, but it's sensitive to polynomial to polynomial growths. Okay. So the goal of the lecture course, as I already mentioned, is to use geometric measure theory to study the growth of um, this filling area function. So the main tools, which I actually um, will introduce for those um, who have not seen them, um, are first current, now not in Euclidean space, but in metric spaces, um, this theory, as I will explain, goes back to Ambrosio and Kirchheim from about um, 14, 15 years ago. And differentiability of Lipschitz maps to metric spaces, um, a theory that was developed by, by, by Ben Kirchheim. And um, we'll also use a, um, we will also use a differentiability into, right, we already said we are interested in nilpotent Lie groups. Okay, so there we will use a different kind of differentiability, the so-called Ponzi uh, differentiability of maps between um, nilpotent groups with, um, with a Carnot character or metric. Okay. So one thing that one should emphasize here is the following. Um, so I already said all the problems that we're going to consider, um, they will already be interesting in the setting of Riemann manifolds. Okay. So then you would ask yourself, well, okay, why would we need if, say, and all results will already be new? Okay. So you might ask yourself, well, why should we use, you know, not use, for example, the Feder Fleming theory of currents, you know, in Euclidean space or then in Riemann manifolds, which you already know from last week, I think. Um, why can't we use that? Or then just draw the Machus theorem? Okay, they, they use a classical Rademacher thing. The thing is, even um, when we're only interested in, in the Riemann, in the smooth setting, we'll actually have to pass to metric spaces. Okay, so, so that's um, somehow what also shows that, you know, this, this theory, even if you, these theories, even if you just want to um, study problems in, um, in a smooth setting, these theories can be extremely, extremely useful. And maybe just uh, uh, one, one, uh, one word why that is the case. Why do we need a thing like metric space uh, theory is the following. Well, we're looking at the growth of the filling area function as r tends to infinity. That means we look at longer and longer and longer curves. Okay? So in order to control what, what we want to do, we'll actually rescale our Riemann manifold or metric space. Right? So we will rescale it. So as that a, a curve of a length thousand will just become a curve of length one again. Okay. So then we'll keep doing that and we rescale our Riemann manifold more and more and more and more. Okay. And what we'll do, we, first of all, that's you know a, a, a metric construction. You can pass to a certain limit space. Okay. We'll analyze this 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 limit space, but this limit space in basically you know almost no um, uh, case will actually be a Riemann manifold, even if you start with a Riemann manifold. Very often this will be uh, a, a metric space. Um, and we will analyze basically 
what you can say about fillings of curves in such a space. Okay, so that's how these how these um, things will, will come. Please, if I go too fast, if you have questions, please uh, please uh, uh, stop me. Okay, so remember what we said already is that if you have strictly negative curvature, then you have the filling function grows linearly at most. Right? Okay. So, but the filling function, you know, only considers long curves. Okay. So basically, what happens? What you think? It, what happens is that, well, on a small scale, say curves of length one, that should not really matter, right? I mean, so on a on a small scale, whether it is, um, say, zero curvature. If it looks Euclidean on a small scale, that doesn't really matter, right? So, um, Gromov, he de de uh, developed a uh, theory of large-scale negative curvature, okay? And um, so, so um, this is the following. So, we start with the geodesic metric space. Now, it's a space where each two points can be joined by a curve whose length is um, exactly the distance between the two points. So now, a geodesic triangle in a metric space is simply three points plus a choice of geodesics between these two, uh, three points. Okay. And so a metric space, geodesic metric space, is called Gromov hyperbolic or delta hyperbolic if every geodesic triangle is delta thin. So delta thin, that means that any of the geodesic sides is contained in the delta neighborhood of the two others. Okay. So you see, for example, this guy here. So the delta neighborhood of the black two is just what I drew in red there. Okay. And so this guy here is exactly contained in these two. And you would have the same thing for, for, for this. So this black one you know, is clearly up till about here. It's in the delta neighborhood of the blue one. And then it becomes in the back one. Okay. So from very far away, from very far away, geodesic triangles, they actually look almost like trees. Okay. Um, so you should think of this uh, Gromov hyperbolicity as a coarse negative curvature. So, of course, that means on a large scale. Okay. So, why is this? Well, let's give some examples. So, first of all, any geodesic bounded metric space, so one with finite diameter, is clearly, you know, delta hyperbolic, Gromov hyperbolic, where the delta is just exactly the diameter. Right? Okay. So, when X is a metric tree, Metric tree, by definition, is just a geodesic metric space, such that every geodesic triangle is exactly a tripod. Okay, it's isometric to a thing like that. That means three segments. Okay, plus you know the metric that if you want to go from here, you have to pass through that point. Okay, so that is actually delta hyperbolic with delta equals to zero. Okay, so then. One can show that if X is simply connected Riemannian manifold with strictly negative sectional curvature, then it is also uh, Gromov hyperbolic. So, but as I already said, it should be a local concept. We saw already in the first example that it is, in some sense, a local compact. And so here you have something that is Euclidean on a small scale, but nevertheless. It is uh, Gromov hyperbolic. So if you take a bounded strip in R2, okay, with the Euclidean metric, then clearly this is also um, Gromov hyperbolic, since you know any triangle that you draw, okay, is always well the thickness is at most you know this uh, width here. So Gromov proved that 
if x is a geodesic metric space, which is chromoph hyperbolic, and such that the filling function is never infinity, that means you can fill every curve, okay? Um, then it is um, gross at most linear, okay? So um, this is a generalization, basically, you know, of this um, result that we saw, that if you have um, sectional curvature, a strictly negative sectional curvature, that filling function um, grows linear at most. Okay. Um, clearly, you know, this condition, you can't just get rid of it, right? Because you can always um, you can always, for example, just here you can punch holes in your strip, right? And of course it's going to change the metric a little bit, okay? The metric now, you, you just want to have the length metric. That means if you go from one point to another here, you know, you actually have to go around here. This is still more or less the, the, the metric that you have um, in, in Euclidean space. And of course, then, you know, you can't fill at all, okay? So then this will definitely not grow, grow linearly. Another thing, if, even if you can fill, what you could do is you could just add here, you know, very many tentacles, Okay, that basically, if you have a curve around here, that, um, so that's still, you know, whenever you have something that looks like this, it's still chromoph hyperbolic because geodesic triangles, they still look like tripods. Um, and so by just making there a lot of, of hairs growing out, okay, of course, a curve around here will have enormously big filling area if you make enough tentacles here. So you need, you need a, uh, a condition like that. Um, so actually, I would just, um, to give you a little bit of an intuition of what this, this uh, actually does, what this chrome of hyperbolicity condition, this tri thin, thin triangle condition um, does, I'd like to give you a, a quick proof of this. Okay? Um, also, because actually I've never found this proof anywhere like this, so... Um, I think it's probably the easiest proof um, that I know, okay? So let's give a sketch of a proof, or actually it's, it's basically, it's basically the whole proof itself. So first of all, um, clearly, it is enough to do the following, to show the following claim. Um, so, yeah, let's maybe first, um, so we will have to fill, we will have to fill Lipschitz curves, right? So, for a Lipschitz curve, what I will show is that you can take shortcuts, okay? So, what I claim is the following. Um, if you have a Lipschitz curve, there exists S and T in S1 such that um, the distance between the points is essentially shorter than the length of the curve between these two things, okay? A smaller or equal to the length of C between S and T uh, minus delta, okay? Where delta is, so where delta is this gram of hyperbolicity constant that we saw, the, thin, the thinness of triangle, okay? that hyperbolicity constant. Okay? So, clearly this is enough, right? So, I start with a curve. Okay? So, um, I find such two points. 
such that this distance is essentially smaller than, 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 than this distance. Oh, what I should say, there exists uh, such that, okay, length, sorry, is smaller than, say, 40 delta, okay, and, sorry, I want that this is also bounded, okay. So, what do I get now? So, I can cut, basically, here this thing off, right, okay. So, I have two points where this is small, much smaller than this, or just by delta smaller, okay. So, this curve in here has at most length 50, um, 40 plus 40 minus, so 79, delta length, right? 79 delta, okay? Okay? So, and now, so because here I can just include, I can just take a geodesic, right? And so I take this curve, I said that this has, you know, smaller or equal to 40 delta, okay? This distance here is smaller or equal to 39 delta, okay? So it's at most, four, yeah, 79 delta, okay? So now my assumption says that this I can fill in, right? By, by something, okay? So I can find ellipses map that fills this in, okay? That's no problem, and you know, um, yeah. Okay, so now I do the same procedure again with this curve here, with the rest curve. So now this rest curve has exact, has length, you know, at most the original length minus delta, okay? So I can do that again. And I just go in steps of delta, okay? And basically that gives you me, every time, gives me something, and so you get a linear amount, so one over delta times the length, basically, times this filling guy for 79 delta, okay? Is that clear? Okay, so that's the only thing we have to show, okay? So, and um, this I'm going to show now. So the proof of claim. So um, we fix a curve. I'm going to do it like this. So let this my, be my curve, C, okay? And um, what I take, I take two points at distance exactly the, the diameter, X and Y. So x and y on the curve um, such that the distance of x, y is actually the diameter of gamma. Okay. And I call this d. Okay. So now I go on both sides of x. I go length 20 delta, okay? So I have here x1, oh, let me maybe do that with y, x1, and here I have x2, okay? So x1 and x2 are such that the length um, of, so now this will just note the length from x to x1, okay? This is 20 delta, which is the length of x, x2. Okay, so th this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean the, the distance between these points, but the length of the curve, right? Okay. So uh, now I'm going to look at two triangles, okay? So um, um, first of all, I should say, so without loss of generality, of course, okay, we have... Uh, that these um, lengths here, okay, that they are um, at, sorry, uh, without loss of generality, if I define di as just the distance now between x and xi, that this is bigger than 19 delta, okay? Because if it was smaller than 19 delta, okay, then we ha would have this already, okay? We would have that the length here 
is smaller than 40 delta, right? And the distance here would be smaller than 19 delta. Here's the length. So we would have our shortcut already. Okay, so that's already good. Okay, so now I look at the geodesic triangle. So this we know has length d. And um, so now, okay, so we're not in Euclidean space, huh? Okay, so a geodesic triangle will look something like this. It has to be thin, right? So it will look something like this. Okay. So now, you know, this side here is contained in the delta neighborhood of these two others and vice versa. So what I'm going to do is I take the last point that is still um, in this delta neighborhood of, of this guy here. Okay. So that means here I have delta. And from now on, it's basically in the delta neighborhood of this. So I also have delta here. Okay. So here I have both smaller or equal to delta. And so this distance here is smaller or equal to 2 delta at the most, right? Okay. So now let me denote this by A1. We will do the same thing on this, on this side as well. Okay. A1, so then because this guy here um, is um, exactly D1, the distance, right? So that's a geodesic now, huh? So then we have here D1 minus A1. So here, these are both geodesics. The endpoints are delta apart, right? So that means, you know, you can bound this from above and from below, you know, by this minus a delta and plus a delta, okay? So, uh, and then, you know, this guy here, the whole thing is delta. So if you have an upper bound on this, you have a lower bound on this. If you have a lower bound on this, you will also have a lower band on this, on, on this guy here, right? Okay, so let me maybe call this B1 here, okay? So now I need, uh, I think probably it's not good to write down there because otherwise you won't see it. So we know what we want to prove, right? So we just want to prove that there are shortcuts. Okay, uh, let me do that. Okay, so what we get, uh, for, for B1, okay, this is bigger or equal to the length here, which is delta, okay? So it's basically, I said already, it's bigger or equal to this guy here minus 2 delta, okay? And so this guy here is bigger or equal um, to, to D minus this minus a little error, right? So we can do, um, we can just calculate. So this is uh, bigger or equal to now D minus uh, D, D1 minus A1 um, plus 2 delta minus 2 delta. Okay. Okay, so this uh, just gives us now, this is D minus D1 plus A1 plus uh, maybe a uh, minus, sorry, minus four delta, okay? So now we know also that this point here, because these guys here are at, you know, um, are at distance to diameter. So this guy here, you know, is this, the distance here is smaller or equal to D, okay? So what we get is that D is bigger or equal to DX1, Y. So, but this is bigger or equal to B1 plus this length here, or this distance here, right, which is basically A1, okay? A1 minus a little error. So this is um, A1 minus delta plus B1, okay? So now you can just plug in B1 here. You have an upper bound, right? So, and then I can calculate basically what A1 is, okay? So, I just plug it in, and um, so what, um, what you get is that A1 is smaller or equal to one-half D1 plus three delta, okay? You see A1 appears twice, right? And, and, and uh, um, so then, then we have this, okay? And since D1, we already said, D1 uh, is smaller or equal to 
the length, which is 20 delta, so that is that we have smaller or equal to 13 delta. Okay. So now we can do exactly the same um, on the other side. Okay. So we can do exactly the, uh, the same on the other side. We have a geodesic triangle here, which looks something like this. We have, again, the same situation. We look where we have this little triangle of, of, of size delta, right? And so we get here, if we take this A2, we get this. Okay. So now, in order to, I would like to show that the distance between x1 and x2 is, you know, smaller than, you know, 40 delta minus delta, okay? 40 delta is the length, right? So now I just, so I'm going to do it like this. This is, the distance is bounded by this distance plus this, plus this piece here, plus this, plus this, right? So the only thing I still have to do, um, I have to go between these two points. Um, let me maybe call this eta, okay? So I have to, 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 to bound this, okay? But this is easy because eta, so we have here is basically d2 minus a2. Here is d1 minus a1. And, you know, basically this distance is at most the difference plus some deltas, okay? So, so first, of course, without loss of generality, we can assume that a1 is bigger or equal to A2. So that just makes then, right, that this point down here is, is lower down than this, the other. So then what we get for eta, this is basically bounded by D2 minus A2 plus, say, 2 delta minus D1 minus A1 um, minus 2 delta. And so that gives us D1 minus D2. Um, plus A1 minus A2 plus 4 delta. Okay. So the D1 minus D2, because they're both pinched between 19 delta and 20 delta, this is going to be smaller or equal to delta, okay? So this guy here is smaller or equal to A1 minus A2 plus uh, 5 delta. And now we're practically done. We just have to add all, everything up, and that will give us what we need, okay? So let's maybe... So we get the distance between x1 and x2 as I already said, this is bounded by A1 plus 2 delta plus 2 delta plus eta plus 2 delta plus A2, okay? Now you plug in, you get rid of the A2 here, okay? So then this is smaller or equal, you get the 2A1 um, plus 2, 4, 9 delta, okay? A1 is smaller or equal to, what did we say, 13 delta. So you get 26 delta plus 9 delta. So this is equal to 35 delta. The length was 40 delta, right, from here to here, and you're done. Okay. So that's, that's you see, that is uh, relatively easy. You just have to use in uh, a very elementary way, uh, this uh, um, triangle triangle uh, comparison things. Okay. Okay. So um, so that's not so surprising, right? To have negative curvature gives you um, linear growth. So, however, there's this, a converse which is much more surprising. So Gromov was able to show that if the filling area function in a geodesic metric space 
grows at most linearly, then the space, the triangles, they must look like this. Okay? Actually, Gromov um, proved something much stronger. Okay? It's the following. Um, so the theorem is due to Gromov, but then because it had, for this mostly geometric group theory, it had a big impact, um, there were lots of other uh, proofs given by, by other people, by Baudic, Strutu, uh, Papa Soklu, Short, and, and others. Um, yeah. So the theorem is the following. If X is a geodesic metric space, and if, so now it's not just, you know, the growth type is quadratic, but now we need a, 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 an explicit constant, okay? If the filling function for sufficiently large R, oops, uh, sorry, um, is bounded by 1 over 4,000, times r squared, so just think very, you know, quadratic but very small growth, then actually x is already Gromov hyperbolic, okay? So, and, as we already saw, Gromov hyperbolicity implies that you have linear growth, so that means if you have quadratic growth with small constant in front here, then actually you get linear growth. So in particular, as a consequence, there exists no geodesic metric space where the filling function has growth between r to the alpha and r to the beta for alpha and beta between 1 and 2. Okay? So that is usually now, of course, um, referred to as the gap in, this, in the isoprometric spectrum. Okay? Because there's nothing between quadratic uh, and linear. Okay. So now, of course, you might think, so well, what does, is this constant here? Okay. What is this odd constant here, 1 over 4,000? Um, so Gromov actually proved when x is a, the universal cover of a Riemann manifold, okay, then I can replace this 1 over 4,000 by, by 1 over 16 pi. Okay. And you still get that. So you see, we have 1 over 16 pi for certain Riemannian manifolds for universal covers. So that's the best constant in that case. On the other hand, we can definitely not go beyond 1 over 4 pi, right? Because R2, you know, the triangles there are clearly very thick, right? So not delta thick if you go, go, go large. So you can't go above that, and this is known. So where is the truth in here? Okay. And what we're going to do, we're going to give the following optimal strengthening of, of Gromov's result, okay, um, using geometric measure theory, okay? And I think, actually, I'm not sh sure whether you can prove it without using you know, these techniques uh, from, from geometric measure theory. Um, so it's the following. So if you have growth slightly below 1 over 4 pi times r squared, then already it has to have linear growth. Okay? So that's basically the first result we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, to get from our techniques from, from, from currents of, of, uh, in metric spaces and metric differentiability. Okay, clearly this theorem is of course optimal because we have for R2 or Rn, we have this constant 1 over 4 pi. Um, then what we will also see is at the same time, so see here, you know, for example, in the Riemannian manifold, um, very short curves, right? I mean, near a point, basically any Riemannian manifold just looks a little Euclidean almost like the tangent space, right? So that means there you have Euclidean, and there, you know, you will never, for a fixed epsilon, you will never, for very short curves, round curves, they will never satisfy this, right? So, I mean, you, you need this R, you know, you need that, it's only for large curves. However, what we will show, and for metric spaces, of course, that works, right? You can have this. Um, so, um, we will show that if this holds for every R, then, your metric space um, will just look
like a metric tree or is a metric tree. Okay? It can be very wild. And then, of course, the filling function in here, right, uh, in a metric tree is just zero. Okay? So you get from subquadratic, you fall down to, to zero right away, of course. Okay? Um, that's something that the proof just will show. As I already um, um, pointed out, for certain Riemannian manifolds, um, co-compact uh, group actions, for example, or universal covers, we have this constant 1 over 16 pi. So, of course, you might also wonder now, so what can we say if in the borderline case? Okay. So, we already saw when epsilon equals to zero. So, we already saw that um, that simply connected dream money manifolds of non-positive curvature, there you have exactly this inequality. Okay. So now this question basically is, well, what about if we know that our space has such a thing, um, can we say something about it? Okay. Um, for Riemann manifolds, it's not difficult to show. If you have a Riemann manifold that satisfies this with epsilon equals to zero, then it has to have non-positive curvature. Um, for metric, general metric spaces, um, it's not so clear. Um, however, it's still true that it has uh, non-positive curvature. In the mo at the moment, so this is uh, um, joint work with, with uh, uh, Alexander Lichak. And uh, at the moment, we can only show it for, for proper geodesic metric spaces. Proper just means that every ball um, of finite radius is compact. Okay. And um, so... Theorem says if you have the Euclidean one, then your metric space has to have non positive curvature in a metric sense, which is equivalent to um, equivalent to, to non positive sectional curvature. So what does cat zero mean? My space X is cat zero if and only if well first of all it has to be geodesic. I already showed the picture, basically. So whenever I take a geodesic triangle, so three points in my space and three geodesics, and now for any such three points by triangle inequality, you know, you know that you have three points in R3, with the property that the distances are the same. So that means this distance here is this distance, this distance here is this distance, and this distance is this distance. And so non-positive curvature just means the following, or cat zero, if I take any two point on two sides, and then since they have the same, I can find comparison points. That means they have the same distance there. Then this distance here is smaller or equal to this distance here. Okay. In Euclidean, uh, in, in, in Riemann manifold, for simply connected Riemann manifolds, this is exactly equivalent to having non-positive sectional curve. Um, so, as an example, one of the examples is, is, is this. Okay. Hmm. We will not um, actually, I, I will not prove this because this relies on, on different methods uh, from, from, uh, from analysis. Uh, this is mostly um, harmonic maps into metric spaces, and I'd rather concentrate on the, on, on the, the currents in metric spaces theory. Uh, to show you, so we will actually not prove, but I'd, I'd be happy to discuss this if, if you if you have uh, things. Okay, this is uh, actually from from this year, so um, we're only we're, we're in the end of writing it up, so uh, you won't find it on the archive yet. Okay, so let's go back to the isometric spectrum. Um, so as we have already seen, there's nothing between linear and quadratic growth. Okay, so. Of course, the question is, are there other gaps in the spectrum? Okay. 
So do you have between two and three? Can you construct you know, uh, things? Okay. The answer is no. Okay. Of course, you can ask more refined questions, but let me just, uh, um, let me just uh, um, mention this result by Grimaldi and Ponsi from 2003. If f is a smooth function with positive derivative, and such that for any k in n, we have that f of k plus times r is bigger or equal to k times f of r for all sufficiently big r. Then if f grows at least quadratically, okay, then there exists a surface of revolution with um, filling area function growing exactly like r. So what does that? So this this is basically almost a necessary condition, or it's very natural in when you look at surfaces of revolution, two-dimensional, right? So basically, what it says is that if well, k times r, if you take a, a a curve, a closed curve, if you go k times around this curve, right? Then, um, well, you could in principle when you fill it, right? So you can just take k times the same filling, the same area inside, right? So this basically just forces you that, you know, um, that you can't have that if you go k times around that this is actually, you know, I mean, yeah, this is at least the filling area, right, that you need, okay? So that's, that's a, 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 a thing that you, you have to, um, yeah. Okay, so that means there's no um, other, um, there's no other, um, gaps in the spectrum. So now I think we're gonna. Um, Sorry. So I mean, what you have to, what you have to, what you have to imagine is the following. I mean, it's, it's basically something like this. So if you basically make it like a cone, almost like a cone, right, it will just have r squared, basically. And then if you, if you make it small here, or not small, but, you know, if, if, if it doesn't diverge too fast, then, you know, you can make it a lot bigger. So, yeah. And then, of course, you know, you, uh, the difficulty, of course, is to prove that, you know, it's not just, I mean, you could, in principle, you could just take the curve at distance, you know, the certain distance here around, and, you know, is, yeah, is this actually the, the worst curve? Could be, I mean, you, you then afterwards you have to look at every curve, right? That, um, and you have to show that this curve here is actually, you know, easier to fill than a curve like this where you have, have to go all, all the way up to the okay. okay, so, so that's, uh, yeah. Um, okay, I think it's probably good to take a break, a 10 minutes break now, and um, then, we're going to go to a different class of 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 of, of uh, metric spaces too. Um, yeah. Okay, that is uh, nilpotent Lie groups. Okay, we'll actually only deal with very special ones. And um, for, for those who are not so familiar with, I'll just give you know as in the Gromov hyperbolicity um, argument, I'll give you one easy um, case to think about, and then uh, we'll do more. In, uh, in, on Wednesday and Friday. So um, we start with a, a connected and simply connected Lie group, G, uh, with Lie algebra, um, G and bracket. Um, okay, so G is nilpotent if there exists a K bigger or equal to one, such that the descending central sequence terminates after K uh, plus one steps, where here G I plus one is the span of all Lie brackets where V is in one before and W is, is in G, okay? So in here, by this I mean that, you know, K should be the first one, the first one such that GK is non-zero and GK plus one is zero. Uh, this is called the step, okay? Um, and so now, G, we will always endow G with a left invariant Riemannian metric, okay? 
So um, in, 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 in analysis of metric spaces, very often you consider left invariant sub Riemann metrics. Okay? But we will just, for the moment, we will just be concerned with, with the Riemannian case. Okay? So locally, they look, you know, um, so left invariant Riemannian metric means just that, you know, when you translate from the origin somewhere else, you know, the metric looks like at the origin, right? Okay, so, so, so translations are isometries. Okay, so Riemannian isometries, yes. Um, so a difficult open problem is to determine the possible growth types of the filling functions of nilpotent uh, Lie groups um, with a left invariant Riemann metric. Okay, so actually you can also ask, of course, about other kinds of Lie groups, but there actually becomes even, so for example, uh, solvable Lie groups, and that becomes much, even much harder. So there you have a huge, vast open field, um, and um, yeah. Okay, so let's maybe consider the first basic example. So, you know, the, the basic, the, the, the easiest example is, of course, Rn, right? Rn is a Lie group um, and uh, of, step, of step one, okay? So the easiest example of um, step two is uh, the end Heisenberg group, which is um, topologically just R two n plus one, okay? But where the multiplication, so a Lie group, remember, is just a, a manifold with a, a group structure that you know is, is smooth. Um, so um, where you have basically in the first two R n's, so here you have x is in R n, y is also in R n, and z is in R. So the first two R n's, um, two uh, R n's, we have uh, just Euclidean multiplication or addition, and here we have an extra term, uh, the, um, the inner product of x with y prime. Okay, um, so this is non-Euclidean um, um, group structure. Okay, so you can easily this clear that this is, is, is a Lie group, and the basis of left invariant vector fields are um, given as follows. So for i from 1 to n, you have x i is d d x i. So it's just the usual i direction in the first r ends. And then in the last one, you just have a vertical. Okay? And in um, the y, you have in the y direction plus something in the z direction in the normal direction, and times xi, okay? So that would be at the point x, y, and z, okay? So you can simply calculate the, um, the brackets, okay? And you will realize uh, um, right away that xi bracket yi is gonna be z, okay? And all the others, um, they will, they vanish, okay? So that means then, that if you take your G1, it's G, okay, that's just the, the, the it's just, um, it's just uh, the X, I, Y, I, Zs, okay, but then if you go to G2, that's already um, there, you, because you have, um, there it's just going to be R times Z, okay, and the third one is going to be zero, okay, so that's, a, uh, you can directly check that HN is nilpotent of step two. We will actually see a bit later that it has some extra structure. It's so, a so-called Carnot group, um, uh, but that will only come later and will become uh, important later. Okay? So now, topologically, this looks like R2n plus 1. Also, yeah, it's diffeomorphic to R2n uh, plus 1. Okay? But when you endow it with the left invariant Riemannian metric, okay, then the filling function shows that this is actually quite far from uh, Euclidean space, okay? So uh, at least when n equals to one, okay? So the first Heisenberg group H1, again, endowed with a left invariant three money metric, has filling, oh shoot, okay, so that should be an H1, sorry, okay? Sorry, that should be H1, okay? Um, has cubic rather than quadratic uh, filling area function. So let me maybe just give you, um, again, for those who are not so familiar with, um, 
with, with, with this geometry, let me tell you, you know, at least the lower bound, why we have at least cubic, right? Okay, and then actually we will give, in a much more generally, we'll give the argument why it has to be smaller or equal to, to cubic. Actually, we will give that for any step k, we will, we, we will do that, okay? So, sketch of proof. of at least cubic. Okay. So I should say again, for small, right, for small r, you know, this because H1 with a left invariant Riemann metric looks locally like Euclidean space. You have, of course, that it's locally, it's, it's for small r, it's r squared, right? So that is only, we're only interested in big, in big, in big scale, okay? Um, so, okay, so I will give you a curve explicitly, you know, which I'll show that is hard to fill. Okay? So the curve is simply the following, and this already reveals a lot of the geometry somehow, what's, what, what, what's happening um, in, in this space, right? Okay, so this, so we are in R, in, in H1, which is basically just, R3, right? So we have x direction, we have the y direction, and we have the z direction. So now I'll construct a curve that goes up for a given L, say bigger than 1, okay? I'll show you how to get here up to L squared. So 0, 0, L squared very quickly, okay? much faster than, you know, Euclidean, it would take you time L squared, but I'll show you that because you go much faster, right? So how do I do that? Well, I first go L in the X direction. So that means here we're at zero, uh, at L zero, zero, zero. And now I look at, so, okay, with, I should have said one thing first, right? It doesn't really depend the filling area function doesn't really depend on what left invariant Riemannian metric I take, okay? Because at the origin, right, they're basically by Lipschitz, okay? So then because, you know, um, so then, you know, any two are by Lipschitz equivalent, okay? So I will, just without loss of, of generality, I will assume, so without loss of generality, I can assume that these vector fields here, x, y, and z, okay, they're at each point an orthonormal basis, at each point. Okay, so now when I'm here at L0,0, well, a unit vector, right, if I go in this direction, y, a unit length, where do I end up? Right? So the unit vector there is basically um, just um, 0, 1, and L. Right? So that means if I go a unit into the direction Y, right, in this direction there, I actually gain a lot of height. Okay? So let me, I'm very bad at drawing it, that you, you already know probably. Um, so I'll, I'll still try to make this picture a little bit, okay? So I go L in the Y direction, okay? So where do I end up? I end up at the point L, L, and L squared, okay? And the length of this curve, okay, is because a unit vector here, right, is just zero, one and L, okay? The length of this curve here is, length is just, is L, okay? So now, I can go just back along the X direction. I end up here at zero L and L squared. And now I go back 
along the x direction, oops, uh, this may be, I go back along the x direction, I get back to 0, 0, L squared. Okay? And so, what, and that's also, this direction is just a unit, right? So, when x is 0, then just y is just d dy. Okay? So, this guy here has length L. This guy here has length L. This L as well. And this L as well. Okay. So, it takes me 4L to get up to here. Okay. So, that means the distance in, you know, with respect to this um, left invariant free money metric between the origin and this point up here is basically for at most for L. Okay. So it's quite different from, from, from Euclidean space. Okay. So now I would like to have a closed curve, right? That is hard to fill. So I have to close this up somehow. Um, I will not go just straight down here because you know this is going to take me L squared. Right? So I would like to have something that's just linear in L. Okay? But what I can do is I can just basically um, go now further in the minus y direction, then go in the minus x direction, and now I go down into the y direction, and you know, basically then I can go down right, at unit length. So I'll try to draw that, but please... Um, um, you, you need to use your imagination to understand my picture here. Okay, so here, here. So I go further in this direction. Okay, then I go here. Oops. I go down. And then I go in this direction. Uh, so that's not correct. Yes, that's correct. So you basically do exactly the same thing, just in the other way around. Okay. So so that's so now we get a curve. Oops. We get a curve of um, length. So this gives us a curve. C closed curve of length exactly one, two, three, four. 8L. Okay. So now I will show that this has um, that this has filling area at least L cubed. Okay. So this is basically calibration argument. So I just um, take the so define a one form. Alpha equals to d to y dz. Okay. So then, um, if I take the exterior derivative, this is just dy dz, the two form. Okay. And just by plugging in the x, y's, and so the, the big x, these are unit vectors, right? Just by plugging in pairs of that, you see that the point-wise norm is at most one. Okay? So this is just, you know, you have dy, dz, right? If you put x and z in there, it's zero. If you take x and y, it's zero. y and t, you get an extra d, dz. But the d, dz, you know, if you have a dz already, that's just cancelled. So that's just most one. Okay, so that's, that's, that's directly. So now I just use uh, Stokes' theorem. Okay, so if I go around, so, well, maybe I should start. So now let sigma be any surface, surface um, with boundary is just my, my curve C, right? So then I have, um, so now you can, you can calculate, you can calculate that, um, I, I'll do that, so I'll do that in a, in a minute, 
so that, LQ, that the integral of the one form over C is L cubed, okay? So then this by Stokes is um, just sigma d alpha, okay? But now, since this is a form that is bounded by one, right? So this gives you that this is small, has to be smaller or equal to the area of, of this. Okay. So, and this is simply a calculation. You know exactly what the curve is like, right? You know exactly the curve. So um, you have dz here. So definitely in this direction and this and this and this, you know, it's all zero, right? And you can just calculate directly that you get uh, th that you get L cubed here. Okay. So for this leg, actually, you get for this leg you get uh, one half L cubed. Okay. And then for the other one going back here, you get one half L cubed again, and then you're done. Okay. Another simple argument is the following that you can actually do, um, which is even more elementary, using uh, so maybe let's say that's the end of the proof. Okay. A different argument you could do is the following. You just project this curve, okay, and the surface. You just project onto the yz plane, okay. Then the curve here will basically just be this triangle, okay. So this will be this triangle in the yz plane, okay, and this triangle clearly here has area. Um, L cubed, more or less, right? So this is just projection, projection uh, along the x-axis. Okay. Sorry. Ah, the other triangle. Sorry. Yes, sure. Thank you. Yes, the other triangle. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So this triangle has L cubed um, area. Okay, because you have basically L and L cubed, uh, L squared here. And so now you just have to calculate, and that's, again, a very simple calculation, that this projection, okay, this is not one Lipschitz. Huh? It is, you know, it distorts lengths a lot, but it actually, you know, doesn't increase area, okay? It doesn't increase area, and again, it's basically the same argument as why you have this. Okay, so that would be uh, a, another proof that you can give, okay? So this gives you why, you know, we have at least cubic, Okay, we will actually give um, um, a bit later something much more general for the upper bound. Okay. Okay. Any questions? So this is very elementary. Um, very elementary. It was first uh, discovered by by, by, by Thurston. Um, okay. So when you take the higher Heisenberg groups, okay, n bigger or equal to two, then the Behavior is, 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 is completely different, okay? So then you have R squared, okay? I should say this should be, you know, the same growth as R squared, of course, because, you know, as soon as you go below, it's grown hyperbolic, but um, um, the Heisenberg groups are, of course, not hyperbolic, okay? So you have actually, yeah. So that was uh, first proved by, 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 by Gromov, uh, and um, Alcock gave a, a very clear um, uh, symplectic argument afterwards um, to, to, to prove that. Okay, so we have these, these things. So now, um, one can generalize Thurston's result for the first Heisenberg group. Okay, so whenever you have a free nilpotent Lie group of step k, then um, the filling area function, of course, again, endowed with a left invariant Riemannian metric, the filling function grows like r to the k plus 1, okay? So one example is the first Heisenberg group, okay? So what does free nilpotent mean? That basically means that um, the Lie bracket doesn't have any additional relation than those that you actually need, okay? So for example, in the, in the, in the, in the higher Heisenberg groups, right, um, there's, there's many, so xi bracket yj, Okay, is always zero. So this is a relation. This is a, a, a zero condition that is not necessary really to define a, a Lie algebra. 
Um, so, so, so that's what is meant by, by free. Okay, I don't want to go into that too, too much, but it should just show you that for any k, not just you know, for, for, for step two, but for any step, you have groups that, um, that you, um, and Lee groups that, that have this behavior. Okay. On the other hand, that's also, in some sense, the worst that you can have. Okay. You cannot grow faster than R k plus one. Okay. Um, so if G is nil potent of step k and either contains a lattice or is a Carnot group, okay, I will explain what that is, um, then the filling area function grows at most Rk plus 1. Okay? The first Heisenberg group, all Heisenberg groups, they are Carnot groups, okay? and I will give, in the case for Carnot groups, I will, I will give the proof. Okay? In the, in the, in the, so uh, not now, but in, in, in three lectures when I actually define, on Friday when I define um, when we're going to prove results about uh, nil potent groups. Um, okay. So the question that was asked for about 20 years in, 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 in geometric group theory um, is the following. If G is nil potent, Lie group, again, endowed with a um, um, with, endowed with a left invariant dream any metric, does the filling area function always grow exactly polynomially? Either, you know, polynomially the sense r to the n, or if you want r to the alpha, where alpha is a, um, is a, uh, a real number. Yes? Oh, you mean you mean this one, yeah. the, the the calibration argument. Oh, oh yes. Oh, I see what you mean. All right. Um, yes. Yeah. But then you only get. Um, yes. So the first Heisenberg group is embedded, of course, in in in. in in the second Heisenberg group, but I mean the filling, right? You have a lot more fillings that you can construct by going out of this. Okay. Um, no, the calibration won't work because calibration won't work because that's not that's not small or equal to one, right? Uh, wait. So you would take just d, d y one and d z. No, shoot, sorry. Now I'm I'm confused. Can we discuss it afterwards? Yeah, that's better. Sorry, at the moment I'm, I don't know what's, what's uh, um, yeah, yeah, let's discuss this afterwards. Um, okay, so, so, so the question that has been asked quite for a long time and you know, whether you always have exactly polynomial growth, okay? Um, and basically why people believed this is mostly because you know, all the examples that one has uh, been able to compute, right, all the results, they always give a exactly polynomial, and always polynomial with, you know, actually an integer um, exponent. Um, so, um, yeah, what we will do, we will show um, that actually the answer is no, okay? So, there exists 
um, nilpotent Lie groups of step two um, that have that have filling function small or equal to r squared log r, and which grow, however, faster than um, r squared, strictly faster. That means r squared times a function, you know, that goes to infinity. Um, so the proof will again use um, tools from geometric measure theory, will be again, we will need the, fa the fact that when you take a nilpotent Lie group of step two, or a Carnot group, and you know you have longer and longer curves. If you rescale this space, then actually you get the space that you know what it is. It will be the same nilpotent Lie group, but instead of a left invariant Riemann metric, you'll get so-called left invariant sub Riemann metric. Okay, and then we will analyze you know basically what happens in that space in order to um, in, in order to uh, to show that if you know, an example that we can construct explicitly, right? if this had r squared, then certain things would go wrong. Okay? Um, so, so, again, in some sense, similar technique to the one that I uh, said before. We rescale, we pass to a limit, and we analyze what, what we have in there. Um, of course, you might ask now, so this, this theorem is just a first very modest step you know, to, to disproving this, 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 this conjecture here. Um, so why? Well, you know, we will use a compactness argument. And this basically just gives you, in the end, that this group will not have a quadratic filling area function. Okay? And it will give you nothing more. Okay? We'll just say you have more than quadratic, but, you know, whether it is maybe even, you know, r squared log r, I don't know. Okay, so there, there's still a lot of questions open. Um, for example, you know, what is exact behavior of this? We'll see this is extremely easy group, actually. Um, the difficulty is just to actually, um, you know, calculate its, its, its filling function. Um, okay, and as I already said, you know, filling functions for, for, for nilpotent um, Lie groups are not well understood at all. Uh, we, for example, don't know whether there's any gaps or whether there's any filling functions between r cubed and r to the 4 or anything like that. So besides this result, we don't know anything uh, about non-polynomial uh, behavior. And I have the feeling that using all the geometric measure theory that one has in, in Carnot groups, okay, one should actually be able to say uh, uh, much more because um, there one actually, uh, yeah. Okay, so in the, for the rest of the time now, I would like to um, just um, give you quickly some motivation why um, the filling function is, is, is uh, studied in, um, in, in, in geometry and uh, in group theory, okay? So the first problem comes from geometry and um, from, from geometric group theory. And basically, the, the, the question is, when do two spaces, two Riemann manifolds, two groups, two metric spaces, um, when do they look alike from far away? How do I determine that? Okay. So what do we mean by look alike from far away? Well, the first trivial observation is that if two spaces are look the same at any scale, also small scale, so that means they're by Lipschitz homeomorphic to each other, then the filling functions, they have the same growth. Actually, of course, even more, right? I mean, we can say that one bounds the other by a constant and vice versa, okay? Um, so, okay, so that's it's just, I mean, it's just going from one space to another, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, Absolutely trivial. Okay. So the fact is that more interesting fact that this is true also if bi Lipschitz homomorphic is weakened to in some sense bi Lipschitz at a large scale. Okay. Um, however, this is not enough. 
you also need some local you know, control, right? Because otherwise, one could, uh, somewhere could, could grow, you know, could have a lot of area needed to, 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 to fill and the other not. So, um, so what do we mean by, by Lipschitz at large scale? That is the concept of so-called quasi-isometries. Okay? Two metric spaces are quasi-isometric. If you have discrete subsets, subsets in each one of them, gamma x and gamma y, that are by Lipschitz homeomorphic to each other, and such that gamma x and gamma y are separated and dense in the following uh, sense. Okay. So any two points in, 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 in gamma x, they're at distance at least a. Okay. And b dense means that any point in x is in the B neighborhood of some points in gamma x. Okay? So that basically just, you know, you look, you discretize in some sense your space, you know, just you take um, points that are sufficiently dense and you want to have a bi Lipschitz um, um, correspondence there. Okay? So clearly, if two spaces are quasi isometric, then that doesn't imply that their filling functions are, right? So for example, R2 is, R2 is clearly quasi-isometric to Z2, right? Okay. Um, so, but the one has zero and the, this one has quadratic um, um, uh, filling function. So, but one still has something, okay? Um, Gromov proved and Brighton gave, uh, actually, Gromov, well, he more hinted at it and Brighton gave a, 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 a full proof uh, that universal covers of closed three money manifolds, closed three money manifold, that means just that it's uh, compact and no boundary, that uh, if universal covers are quasi isometric, then their filling functions are the same. Okay. And the proof is. Um, actually a version of the Federer-Fleming deformation theorem for currents where you basically take a cubicle, sub, a cubicle subdivision okay, and, um, of, of your space, of, of Rn, right? And then you deform a curve or you know, a higher dimensional thing into a into the skeleton, the one skeleton, in, in this sense, okay? So you build curves that you can control, okay? And these you can transport via the quasi-isometry, okay? So there, um, that is again an idea from, 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 um, from this, okay? Sorry. Yes? Um, no, that's actually not, that's not enough. So what you basically need is you, you need to, you need to be able to control, you have to have, in some sense, the same geometry at every place, at the, at the given scale. Okay? So just think, just think of the, of the following example. Um... So you take R2 on the one hand and on the other hand you take R2 so but now basically I take balls it's just a sequence of balls of radius say 1 okay and now I just Basically, what I do, I, I wrinkle things up here to make. So, for example, you, you just add a lot of tentacles here. Okay. So many that, you know, basically the area in here is large. Okay. But such that the 
the, 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 the metric you know, is still not so far from Euclidean. Right? Okay, so you don't want to go have long tentacles, right? because otherwise, suddenly, this would not be quasi-isometric to this anymore. Right? So, but just, you know, just make things wilder and wilder and wilder. Okay. And you, know, you go that and you, you make it extremely wild here. Okay, just to add more area, that's the only thing that you want, right? And now, of course, these two are still quasi-isometric. Okay, this you should endow, of course, with the length metric, right? So, uh, so because basically you can just take the same, you know, integer points here, and if you place that right, it will never be in an integer point, and basically to go from here to here, it's not much further than, you know, in the Euclidean space, okay? So you need to have a control locally on a certain scale, okay? And that's basically what, 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 what gives you this. You can actually generalize this, but it's, it's uh, yeah. Um, so if you have a, a Riemannian manifold with a co-compact group action, then this is already enough. Yes? So the DTS comes from your computer domain. So what is normally as uh, multiplicative constant is like one. No, I don't think so. Um, simply, again, because, um, because basically it, it, it's, um, it also depends on, on, on the local geometry again, right? Because it even, and this basically would be, would be multiplicative constant one, but you can make them as, as different as you want, right? I mean, up to a certain, certain thing. You can just add these things at many places and then, and then you get, get worse things. Okay, yes, I don't, don't think you can say anything. Okay, so that's the first motivation. I mean, that's just the motivation why I want to say people are interested in, you know, uh, when, how to, to, to figure out whether two spaces look alike from, from, from far away. So in some sense, a large-scale classification of mostly that's done in group theory, um, but also, you know, in geometry with, with uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so what you can already say, for example, right, is now that the Heisenberg group, the first Heisenberg group and R3, they are not quasi-isometric, okay, because they have, one has quadratic and the other one has, um, has a um, cubic uh, filling area function. Okay, the second uh, motivation um, is, uh, comes from purely from, from group theory, um, so now, don't be scared. I know this is uh, a course and should be a course in school in geometric measure theory. Um, so I will just uh, quickly uh, tell you um, about a related filling function which appears in, in, in group theory. So we start with a finitely presented group. So this basically is just, um, you have a finite set of generators and then a finite set of relations. So you take a finite set S and you take uh, the free group generated by S. Basically, what you have to think about is uh, an element. An element in the free group is just going to be a finite word of letters in S. Okay? And basically what you eliminate is you don't want to have S and S minus 1. Okay, so that should be that should be that should be the identity. Okay, so so you have just words in that, and so you have a finite set of um, of, of relations. This R is a relation, and then G is um, isomorphic to the free group um, quotient out the smallest normal subgroup generated by F. So as a quick example, Z two has two generators, A and B, and one relation, okay? So, it looks as follows. So now, you should just take the integer points, but it's easier to visualize, okay? So you have, say here, you have your identity, then you have one generator A, one generator B, okay? And, the relation that you have in the group is just A, B, A minus 1, B minus 1 should be the identity. Okay? And every, yeah. So, 
OK. So now, the, 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 the length of a word, so we will basically, you would like to you know, define something like a filling area function. There we did length and area, right? So a word, or a, just an element of the free group, as I said, can be written as a, a word like this, uniquely, up to this not allowing s minus, s minus 1, okay? And its length, we just, you know, the number of letters that we have in there. So now, for a word, a word in, or an element in the free group, which I will call the word, um, represents the identity in, in G, if and only if it can be written in this way, as a product of, of um, conjugates of relators. Okay? So, for example, yeah. Okay. And... So if it represents the identity, we just um, define its area as the minimal number of um, minimal number of, um, of 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 relators that we need to write it. Okay? Let's maybe make an example. Okay? So let's let's look at the word at the following word. I'll just do it geometrically already. Then you see easier what's happening. Okay, I'm not sure we can see this. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Okay, so this word, what is this? This is just a b a squared b squared a minus one b minus one and then a minus a squared, and um, b minus b squared. Okay. So now I would like to write it. We already said, remember, c2 is just two generators plus one relator, a, b, a minus one, b minus one. Okay. And so now I would like to write it um, as, a, as a product of those. So now I should use another comma. So how do I do that now? Well, we see already here what we could do. We can write the word. We can just insert stuff, right? So what we'll do is the following. A, B, A minus 1, B minus 1. Okay, so we added two things that we should not have done. So we go back and then continue. Okay, so that means we write the following. This is just a, b, a minus 1, b minus 1. So that's already one of our relators. And now we've added two things too much, b and a. Okay, and then comes the rest. So basically we split off this, and now we have a squared, b squared, and so, and so on. Huh? Okay, so basically what we've done here, we have this. Okay, now the second word, what do we do? Well... We could, well, we can do uh, various things, okay? We could, for example, go further here, further here, until here. And we can add a thing in here, okay? Uh, sorry, that's maybe not the best thing. No, let's not do that, sorry. I like it better when we do... Let's go till here, All right? Then we add two things in here, okay? So basically, we added this guy here and this guy here, okay? So then we added again uh, a thing, right? So, oops. So, um, so we have one relator, and then we go, we have this, this, let me call this R, this relator, then we have b a um, squared, okay, and then we have a b and so on, we have again the relator, right? So we have a b a minus 1, b minus 1, okay, and now we have to go, um, we have to go back again, we have 
just B and A, right? Okay? And so we go on like this, you know, and we just basically go around our, uh, our, our thing. And you see what happened already in the, first, in the first thing, right? We basically, we used, for this square, we used one, we reduced our word, okay, to get a word that includes one less, one less square, okay? The second time we do that, we lose one square again, okay? Then we lose this square, we lose this square, we lose this square. So the area of this word, if you just continue this process, will just be one, two, three, four, five, okay? And as you see, basically, you know, a word represents just the, um, represents a, a curve in the skeleton here, and the area is basically just the area included in here. Okay. So this shows then that when you have any word that represents the identity, so for any word, that is the identity, then this is smaller or equal to, I think it's something like smaller or equal to, um, well, a constant times um, the length squared. Okay. okay, so you have basically, and you can actually, yeah. So now we have this word, okay, and we, we define the Dane function now of uh, what's called the Dane function in exactly the same way we did that with the filling uh, area function, okay. Instead of curves, Lipschitz curves, we take uh, words that represent the identity, okay of length, you know, smaller than n, and, you know, we take its filling area, right? Okay, and so, um, um, yeah, so that gives us an, an analogous uh, construction to the filling area, okay? And uh, the main result of Gromov and Brighton says that if G is the fundamental group of a closed free money manifold, then the Dean function of the group um, grows the same way, has the same growth as the filling function of the universal cover. Okay. So that means, you see, this is, you know, to analyze this Dean function, you know, is an algebraically extremely difficult problem, right? So um, you can actually reduce it to something geometric where you can use geometry, geometric group theory, whatever analysis, whatever you, you, you want, which um, seems to be much easier uh, because you have much more tools, okay? You go from a discrete setting to a uh, geometric setting, and um, yeah. Um, yes, so I think, um, what's the time? Okay, um, I think I have one more slide, if I um, correct, correct, okay? Um, so yeah, here, I mean, you basically see already, right, if you take a square, curve, right, then basically you have that the, uh, the area is exactly um, the um, length squared times um, a constant, right? Okay, so one last motivation is also from geometric group theory. Um, so if you have a finitely generated group with generators G1 through GK, um, and you look at, um, at words, right? Um, so again, just an element of the free group, um, there is the so-called word problem, which asks, does there exist an algorithm which determines whether a given word um, represents the identity in G? So you would like to, you know, have an algorithm so that you can feed your group or, you know, um, your group, your presentation into the, into the, into the thing and ask then whether, um, you know, a given element is the identity or not. And the result is the following, that if G is finitely presented as before, and is the fundamental group of a closed free money manifold, then um, the word problem can be solved, that means there exists an algorithm, um, if and only if the Dean function or the filling function is computable. That means, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I think um, I'll stop here, and so, on Wednesday, we're going to set up the, um, the, the machinery from, um, I'll say, 
some words about um, currents in metric spaces and differentiability of maps into metric spaces, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll start proving um, these theorems. Okay, thank you.